It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. Today is another episode of Frontline Friday with my regular and very special guest, Bridget Gleason. Bridget, how are you today? I am doing great, Andy. How are oh, you? Oh, how good. are you and where are you? <laughs> That's right. The Where's Waldo part of the show. The Where's Waldo. Yeah, I'm in the New York studios of the vast zero-time selling media empire. Empire. Yes, yes, I love that. Yes. So, yeah, we're here and hopefully we'll get this interview uh, completed before the thunderstorms arrive. That's right. That's right. I did uh, see that in the New York Times this morning for some reason that there was some article about that. So yeah, yeah. So we may have a little background noise at some point, but if, yeah, <laughs> it's just mother it's, it's nature. It's about what we're saying. It's yeah, that's about right. What we're saying. That's I want right. the thunder and thunder, thunder and, lightning. and lightning of sales. That's what we're exactly, talking about today. Exactly. It's so compelling. It is. So yeah, what what I want to talk about and this morning was what, how does sales stay relevant. Because here's here's what we're seeing. We're hearing a lot of talk about a certain large fraction of business to business sales jobs are going to disappear over the next five years. You know, various Don't projections. Say. I know. That's yeah, I know. You're tired for a of hearing long it. Long time, but good. <laughs> and, I, it, and it still it still continues. To it be still continues. About. And yeah. and part of what I do with this podcast is I interview a lot of CEOs mm. and company executives whose companies are bringing to market products to help automate and much of the sales process or certain aspects of it. And so I think the goal is eventually to automate a good, much larger portion of it. So technology is changing everything from both the perspective of the buyer as well, which has sort of preceded technology changing the life of the seller. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting. Just Let's just talk a little bit about where we think it's going to go and maybe what some of the perhaps pitfalls of, of automation are I mean, because some of the benefits are undeniable in terms of facilitating certain tasks in sales, especially as we migrate to more of an inside sales environment, undeniable benefits of some of the applications that are out there. And I'll let you jump in and talk about how much easier sales development roles have gotten as a result of that. But what's sort of the end game that we see in mind right today? And this is you know, just our opinion. It'll change, but thought worth getting into today. Yeah, I think it's a good question, and it's especially around automation, Andy. We talk about it a lot at Sumo Logic, and as you said, there are pitfalls with it. Automation is good to help offload tasks that are very repetitive and that it doesn't make sense for the rep to, to just they're time-consuming, and there's no added value with what a human can add to it. So, for example... Yeah, let's give examples. So what, what are some of the examples that you have for... So, one example would be um, logging a- appointments in Salesforce, meetings and notes, etc. Both and things making, that are coming up task as well as notes uh, for emails. what happened. E- exactly. So, the f- that if I can have... If there's a, a tool, Yesware does this, where every email that I send to a customer or a prospect, it's automatically logged and recorded in Salesforce. So mm-hmm. the rep is not having to go in cut and transcribe and- notes and cut and paste and put it in, which can be very time-consuming. That's an excellent use of automation. Some of the, di- the, the dialers that go through and, and call and go through numbers, excellent use of automation. Yeah, and especially those that, that record the calls as well, that provide the ability to go back after the fact and listen to them and so on. For managers to do coaching and of their reps, great, great use of automation. Yeah, precisely. So there's a whole bunch that help. I think where we get into, where I see, where we get into a bit of a, a gray area and where we have to make sure that we don't over-automate is tools that allow... Uh, sales reps to mass email. This is one example. Mass email. So they can send basically a templated email, um, kind of a mail merge capability to 200 people, let's say. 
and it's a template and it's very easy. And, and in some cases, that might be good. So let's say I've got a reminder for a webinar that's coming up. And I've got me, the sales rep, has my list of 15 or 20 that's coming, and I want to send basically the same thing to them as a reminder. Mm -hmm. Easy, simple, great. Um, I may add a personal note, whatever. I think that's that can be useful. Where it's not useful is if they... If there's no personalization or or so little personalization or customization that it becomes so generic as to be not useful. Yeah, I've, I've coined my own term for that. Okay, I, let's I hear call it. it. I call, I call, <laughs> Can't wait. I, I know. I, I, hear beta I love these. I know. I call Def- it transparent personalization, meaning that. It's so transparent that it's not personalized. <laughs> I know. It's, it, that it's, that's routined. Uh, yeah, just putting in a first name. I call that transparent personalization. Yeah, and I'm not, I get dozens of these. I probably get 10 a day of, of different, those are the ones that I notice. I, I, I perhaps get more, they get caught in, my, in spam filters, et cetera. And it's so obvious, the ones that I'm part of a, a mail merge, mm-hmm. and it's a very generic message, and it's you know, it's interesting on LinkedIn because we're starting to get more through LinkedIn. My LinkedIn profile is Bridget L. My initial Gleason, and I've left it that way because it's very easy then for me to see which, which ones are just mail merged because it'll say, "Dear Bridget L." or yes. "Hi Bridget L." And you can tell somebody, did, this is not coming from, you don't send me emails, Andy, that say, hi, Bridget L. No, I, and, and I do the same thing. I, I misspell my first name. That's how I know. Yeah. And, and so there are, I'm, I'm immediately turned off by the ones that are just, that, that, are, that a rep hasn't taken the time to understand me a little bit more, my business a little bit more people around me a little bit more to make any more of a connection than just to send me something that's um, transparently personalized, to use your term. So, and I think that's where, you know, I, I coach the reps here that the the reason for the automation is to help with those repetitive tasks and to help, let's say, with a, a template functionality, that there may be, there may be even paragraphs of something that you have written or another rep has written, especially if you're in a very technical sale, that it helps to be able to repurpose pieces of it, but not so blindly that you're not paying attention um, to what's really relevant for that prospect. The other thing I notice, Andy, which really gets to me that I can tell with templates is when the fonts change. Yeah, and well, <laughs> yeah, that drives me nuts. When multiple, font, multiple fonts in a, a single email that are not a function of design, but a function of, of sloppy cut and paste. Yeah, Sloppy cut and paste. That, yeah. okay, I've slapped this in, I've slapped this in. And again, there's not the care and concern and respect around, I am asking for someone's time, even if it's for them to read an email. So and, I think, oh, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to say, I think maybe one of the ways to just sort of dawned on me to sort of think about this is, based on the comments you were making, is that that right now, sales automation appears to have the biggest value in automating what I'll call sort of back-end tasks, right? Is updating CRM. Really important. You know, a lot of value to be able to do that, both for tracking trends, for dashboards, metrics, for managers and reps to be able to sort of keep track of what's going on in an account if they want to go back and do deal strategies and so on. And so, yeah, if you can automate getting that information into your CRM system, great use, right? It saves a lot of time, a lot of hassle, increases compliance, and, uh, yeah, the tool's only as valuable as the data that's in it, right? Correct. But Correct. it seems to be less strong currently being applied to the buyer. You mean some more, more middle-of-the-funnel type things? Yeah, I mean... Even at top of the funnel, when we talk about these emails that go out, um, yeah, it's really 
you know, we've had this. This is not the first time I've had this conversation. I've had it with hundreds of my guests on the show is that we're still sort of shooting ourselves in the foot, you know, as an industry, with the way sales industry is the way we're using these tools. And maybe part of it's a learning curve that we're going through. But, you know, we're still sending out emails that, as like I said, are, are thinly personalized. And, you know, it's very transparent to the user that it's just spam. And so I guess that's maybe how the, and it opens a path for how the technology may evolve, you know, where we get enough intelligence behind it where the, the, we have agents or bots that go out and do the scanning of the, before they do the mail merge, they scan everybody's individual profiles and digital footprints and, and are able to personalize the mail in a way that, that may be better than a person could. I mean, that may be the future, but in the meantime, you get emails like the one I got yesterday. I was looking at here on my, my desktop from VP of supposedly a VP of business development at this company that, that sort of starts out about, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm writing in hopes of talking to the appropriate person at your firm that handles critical app product development. And the next line says, you know, typically Fortune 5,000 clients. <laughs> okay. We can just stop there, right? Because yeah. I'm not a Fortune 5,000. <laughs> I'm a, yeah, sort of a one man band with, with, you know, a big virtual team that supports me. But yeah, right. I've never fit that so customer you can profile. Tell, right. So, right there, you know, whenever we, Look at it. Look at something incoming to us. Like let's say, uh, if it's a voicemail, if it's an email, if it's a letter. One of the first things we do is look at: Is this for me? Was this intended for me? And am I the right audience for this? And if they don't have your name right, you you that's the first clue. Well, this wasn't intended for me. Do they have the right audience? When you start to see when they're describing their target and it's not you, that's a delete. And there's also, like you said, there's, we feel a bit offended that in a, in a, we have to assume that the person is busy and they've got a lot coming their way and there's some amount of time that they're taking and giving you the courtesy of even reading what you've given them. And if you, start right off the bat that you've misidentified or you, you don't have the right person. It's just, it leaves a bad taste yeah. in people's mouths. Right. So top of the funnel, we still got, I mean, automation is being applied. And actually there are some companies now they are coming out with applications that they almost have two parts of their business. Part of they got into the business uh, originally because they had arms of their company or maybe the original company that was doing outsourced lead development and lead generation. And so they've got this database of you know, one company I was talking to yesterday that has uh, you know, done like a million and a half interactions over the last I don't know, five years, 10 years, something like, forget the time frame mm. of making outbound phone calls, outbound emails, and they've tracked everything very tightly, right? And so they have the they have this history of a million plus transactions of, at least from their perspective, what works on an email basis, what works on a phone call basis, how many calls it's going to take, what's the appropriate cadence you should put together for sales development, what works, and now bring out apps that are based on that depth of experience. I mean, to me, that's kind of cool. That's Very that, cool. That, that starts making a lot of sense is that, okay, we're applying some automation that's based on this huge uh, database of activity. It's not necessarily our own because I think for a lot of companies – when they say, yeah, we got our metrics and we can see what works is, yeah, I mean, until you've, is a few thousand phone calls, I mean, is it, <laughs> or a thousand customers you're pursuing, is that a really significant enough database and sample size to make that relevant? Well, you could make that argument that it's probably not for most companies until they've used it for a few years. Yeah, and, and I think, Andy, to your point, I think these are evolving and it's still new and we're learning how to use them more effectively. And I think it, they're going to continue. I, they're going to continue evolving. And I think that's what's exciting to think about is I, I don't think salespeople are going to go away because I think I, I don't think we're that close to having a bot that can read 
sort of the read between the lines, let's say, and and get at the emotion. And as you and I've talked about, people buy based on emotion and then they justify that decision based on data. Mm-hmm. So I think there's we're a long way from having a bot be able to handle both both sides of it, kind of the emotional and the data driven. But I think in conjunction with one another, the personal and the data, we get to have a very strong, that's a strong combination. And I think that benefits both the buyer and the seller. Because for me, I want, I want to know of things that are going to make my life easier or where I can get a better deal. Or like, let's say, for example, I'm planning a trip to... Well, let's say Russia, which is where I'm going tomorrow, for ejemplo. <laughs> and bon voyage. I, and I want to fly business class, and I've got miles in these three different places, and I've got a credit card that does this. It would be super helpful for me if there was somebody in analyzing my activity and my searches understood three months ago, oh, it looks like she's planning a trip to Russia, and gave me, here's a great deal best deal on a business class ticket using your miles, combining these three. I would think, gosh, that's great. I'm glad you found me to sell me that. Somebody that then is trying to, let's say, sell me um, a cruise through the Caribbean, I don't want to see those. I don't want to get that. And so I think there are certain things that we, I, I, I want the buyer-seller uh, relationship and that information to be more tightly aligned so that the emails that I get, the inquiries that I get, the phone calls that I get are more relevant to me and what I care about. So I think I think as we move forward, it benefits not only the seller, but also the buyer. And that's that's really the goal is that we're, we're making this experience less frictionless for both buyer and seller. Yeah, and I think I agree 100%. And I, I think the danger that still exists, and that this hasn't really been thought through for a lot of companies that are sort of busily trying to engineer the sales rep out of the sales process, especially in the business-to-business environment, is that to the extent that you do that, you're basically commoditizing your product. You know, if you want to take the person out of it, what you're basically, at least in my mind, what you're saying is that, yeah, we're basically selling a commodity. I mean, yeah, you can find out everything you need to know about it. But if there's no value that's going to come to the come to the buyer through having a sales interaction and a, say going through a buying a process with a sales rep and with the company, then you begin to make the argument and say, okay, well, if they see no value in the channel, then the product itself is sort of becoming a little bit commoditized. And you put yourself in a different category of product or service in terms of people's perception of its value and its worth and interchangeability of it. Yeah, and I, th- I think that's true. I think it's, it's the changing role of the salesperson also is to understand not, not only the product, but the context. So the context, the customer's context, the prospect's context, and how this product or service in relation to whatever that environment is is going to bring about uh, a benefit or an outcome that's well, yeah. going to be beneficial. Right, and providing value. I mean, the channel has to provide value. value. And it, Neil Rackham, great author of Spin Selling and you know, pioneer in the whole sales business, uh, uh, you know, wrote a book, gosh, almost 20 years ago about how the sales force is changing and brought this point up about if the, value, if the channel doesn't bring value, then you know, the buyers don't need it. If they don't need it, you know, they're not going to pay extra for it. They're going to go someplace where they can pay less. And right. so, yeah, if you're if you're re if you're re-engineering all your processes to get the sales reps out of it, you're basically sending a message to your buyers that, yeah, there's no value in our channel. So ours is a product you really want to buy on price and features. And and there are some products that that's appropriate. Sure. And there but are. But you see, increasingly, sort of in some. Business to business products. Well, you think at least intuitively. Well, that's not really the case, right? Is the company really understanding this is what they're doing? Yeah, and, and I would say companies. More and more companies are having 
different channels that are focused on different types of buyers or even different products. So many companies do have a self-service option where you don't need a sales rep. And so the, the value proposition is easily understood. It probably is a bit more commoditized, but anytime you go, um, there may be a level or a level of service or a type of product that a company does sell that does not lend itself to a self-service model. And then the sales rep, of course, is very, very important. And even in the self-service, um, oftentimes there is a, a live person or chat or someone available to help assist and answer questions and uh, kind of uh, position it not so much as a commodity. Um, it's just something that you can, you know, I need 18 pens or whatever it is. Well, and I think that's really becomes one of the, the key challenges for companies is because I think that's a great, a great point you brought up because there are some SaaS companies I know that are, are, saying, yeah, we can sell that way. We've got a value-added product, and we can sell it basically through a combination of inbound marketing and chat. And I think it's a fascinating you know, sort of experiment to see if that's sustainable over time. Uh, is, and if so, you know, how can you expand on that? Because it's, it's involving or still requiring some level of personal contact you talked about, mm -hmm. but even sort of one step removed from talking to somebody on the phone. It's 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 gonna be fascinating to see because I, yeah, definitely the automation is coming. I think that that sales reps, rather than feeling threatened by automation, really need to understand what the automation means for what they need to do relative to their product knowledge and their skill sets, and the type of value, understanding the real value that they're able to bring to their customers. Because if they're not mindful of that, then yeah, they're gonna wake up one day and find that. The product they're selling can be sold without a sales rep intervening. And that may be okay for the company, but it's not going to be okay for them. Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, if you're listening to this, automation, it's coming. It can be extremely beneficial. I mean, I use it extensively in my business. Some, most people do, and, and, you know, certainly I'm in the sales business. But you always have to be mindful that, you know, you're just, you're not, you're not a passenger on the bus. This is, this is a bus you're driving individually. And you need to take the steps to make sure that you maintain your relevance. And that is keeping your skills up, learning new skills, learning new knowledge, acquiring new knowledge, so that you're always in that value-added position for the buyer. And then your risk of being made irrelevant really drops. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Okay. Well, good. Well, that's it for this conversation. I want to thank my guest, Bridget, to uh, say Dasvidanya as you head off to Russia for That's a few right. weeks. That's right. That's right. Though you'll still be on the show next week through the power of, of pre-recording our episodes. Uh, for the power, through the power of technology. That's right. Power of technology. And, uh, geez, if you have any comments, anybody listening, please make sure to send us an email. You can send us an email at andy at zerotimeselling.com. We'll have questions or comments, we'll talk about them in, in one of our upcoming shows. Or actually, uh, we have a phone number. You can call 619-866-4681. You can ask a question or leave a comment. And when you call that number, you'll get a very British-sounding woman asking you to leave a message somewhat curtly, but uh, just ignore her and please leave a message. And Bridget, we'll look forward to talking to you next time. All right. Take care. Have a great one. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com.